Right to go? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Mark Howden. I'm the director of the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you all here this morning for this event uh, with the uh, um, Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Victoria of Sweden uh, and Prince Daniel. Um, and they're just about to arrive, so if you could all be upstanding for the arrival. So if everyone could be seated. Uh, and we have uh, to start with some introductory remarks by our famous Vice-Chancellor, um, Brian Schmidt, who is well known to the Swedish royal family through, amongst other things, the award of his Nobel Prize. Uh, Brian. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the Australian National University, I am delighted to welcome you all to this morning's panel discussion. As is Australian custom, I begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. The Ngunnawal Nambri people have been here for more than 20,000 years, using Cambri, where we meet today, as their meeting place. Your Royal Highness, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to Australia's National University. I also extend my welcome to other members of the Swedish government, along with staff, students from our campus, and of course, Prince Daniel, welcome as well. I first met Her Royal Highness in 2011 when I received the Nobel Prize. I remember walking down the stairs together, being beatly, uh, deeply intimidated by the ceremony proceedings and the strobing uh, flashes that were trying to get a picture, not of me, but of Her Royal Highness. ANU, as Australia's only national university, has a unique role. We are a research-intensive campus which provides a world-class education for our students who come from over 100 nations. Uh, our remit here as the national university is to undertake research that benefits all Australians and undeniably climate change is one of the most pressing challenges to humanity's existence. For many years, ANU has been recognized globally for our leading work in climate and energy research, including areas of policy, economics, social psychology, governance, and underlying technologies. Now, there have been long-standing links between ANU and Sweden. In the last fortnight, as everyone here will know, the founding director of the ANU Climate Institute, Professor Will Steffen, passed away. He was a fierce advocate of climate change action and also shared a connection to Sweden, which is very deep with Stockholm University and the Volvo Prize Foundation. He will be missed. And I would also say he is probably irreplaceable. In 2021, we launched the ANU Insti Institute for Climate, Energy, and Disaster Solutions, of which Professor Mark Howden, who is moderating today's panel, uh, is the director. The Institute brings together over 570 researchers from across the university to find solutions across disciplines. And today's panel will focus on electrification. The data is clear. Although electrification has reduced national greenhouse gas emissions by about 7% to date, this is well below its potential. We need to increase electrification exponentially to meet the Paris Agreement targets, and we need to do it quickly, ethically, and economically. Here in Australia, we have tremendous opportunity to cut greenhouse gas emissions through electrification with renewable energy. Whilst currently at an early stage, electrification is accelerating rapidly and is expected by 2030, over 80% of Australia's power will be renewable. You'll be glad to know that the room that you're in is entirely renewable, as is the entire ACT. That green electricity will increasingly power Australia's transport and industrial systems and our homes. We have initiative, initiatives like the ANU Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program, which Associate Professor Marnie Shaw, who joins our panel, will be able to discuss further. We also have academics looking at how we can generate green steel. This is a specialty of Sweden. 
And importantly, we have academics researching critical raw materials and how we can both explore for and extract these, meeting the growing global demand again in a carbon neutral way. Now I'm going to hand back to Mark Howden in a moment, but before I do, I do want to thank and acknowledge the work across ANU and the Swedish Embassy to bring this event together. It is a great example of the intersection of academia, government, and international diplomacy and people working together to address climate change, and we need more of it. Thank you all, and Mark, back to you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. And uh, we have some uh, words, I think, from the Crown Princess. Is that right? Vice Chancellor, Nobel laureates, Excellencies. Minister, Assistant Secretary, members of the university faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, start by acknowledging the Nagunaval people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. My husband and I are delighted to be visiting Australia and to be here with you today. We have received a very warm welcome and have already had the chance to see a little glimpse of your country's breathtaking beauty. Yesterday, we um, visited the Namaji National Park and were absolutely blown away by the uh, pristine bushland and the sweeping grasslands and the mountains. It was a thoroughly enjoyable experience, not least to us coming from a wintry Sweden. During our visit here, uh, during our visit, we uh, were of course reminded of the uh, absolutely terrible images of the bushfires from uh, 2020. I remember well that uh, the fires were a uh, topic of discussion uh, with our children around the dinner table in Stockholm, and I believe in many other countries around the globe as well. In fact, these bushfires were an eye-opener for many people that climate change is real. Hearing the stories from the local fire brigade yesterday in National Park was truly moving and at the same time shocking. In the uh, 2020 fire, 80% of the National Park was burnt. The bushfires, uh, the bushfire was to, uh, totally changed the landscape in many ways and threatened native animals, including threatened species and ecological communities. Ladies and gentlemen, loss of biodiversity is one of the greatest challenges facing humanity today. Extinction of animals, plants, and other organisms threaten life support systems on which we depend, like food, fresh air, and clean water. Climate change affects the planet itself, as well as us who live there, humans and animals alike. More recently, we have seen the terrible floods in New Zealand and Pakistan, and simultaneously droughts in large parts of eastern Africa. Glaciers are melting, and small island states fear that uh, rising sea level will eliminate their existence. Climate change is real, and it impacts us all, here and now. So, here and now, is a good place and time for a deliberation about things that can be done to mitigate the situation. Vice Chancellor, I thank you and the Australian National University for hosting this seminar on electrification and energy security. 
The Australian National University is widely known for its cutting edge research, also in the fields of climate change and energy. I, uh, and I know that Australia, <clears throat> I know Australia to be a country with great potential for green transformation, not least within the field of energy. I am very happy to see representatives from both government and industry. The nexus between science, policy, and industry is key. Energy and electricity make up the foundation of any modern society. Ensuring access to clean, constant, and affordable energy is one of the most important tasks at hand. Success in the green transition uh, in the energy sector is a priority for policymakers across the globe. To counter climate change and mitigate its consequences, we need to address the ways in which we construct our energy systems. We need to ensure that our energy infrastructure is fit for the world of today and tomorrow. We need to optimize use of the resources we have. That way, we can strengthen our response. That way, we can also increase the security and resilience of our societies. We are at a junction that requires us to find solutions for transforming the way we produce and consume energy. I am proud to say that we have a large number of Swedish companies and research institutes working toward this end. They are at the forefront, leading the way in developing clean and competitive energy solutions. I also know that their interest is great in collaborating with Australian partners and contribute to Australia's energy projects. I hope that today's seminar can be a stepping stone towards enhancing this collaboration. I am certain that the, ch uh, that the exchange between our countries, between our governments, our research institutions, people to people, and business to business will benefit the competitiveness of both our countries and the world at large. We are facing that global challenge together, and we will master them through collaboration. I look forward to listening to today's discussions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for those words. And uh, it just uh, illustrates, I think, the, the strength of the bonds and the commonality of the pathways which our two countries are going down and, and the need to work together to solve these global challenges. Uh, so how we're going to run this next session, uh, we've got tight timelines here. So what we're going to have is a fairly brief panel session. Uh, so we're, I'm going to introduce the panel members in a second, uh, followed by uh, a Q&A um, after some uh, prepared questions. Um, so just to introduce the panel members, uh, initially, um, Johan, uh, uh, Johan Forschel, um, is the Swedish Minister for International Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade, if you can come up and grab a seat. Um, uh, sec next, we have Martin Merrick, um, who's the President and CEO of Volvo Australia. Welcome. Um, so then we have Associate Professor Marnie Shaw, who's from the ANU School of Engineering, and she's the research lead at the ANU's Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program. Welcome, Marnie. <laughs> and we also have Matt Ryan, who's the Assistant Secretary of the Transport Branch at the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> So you can see that uh, sitting up here, we've actually got a really interesting array of uh, people uh, coming from government, uh, from industry, uh, from research, uh, and that's both governments from Australia and Sweden. 
And uh, so hopefully we can have a lively panel discussion here. So the first question uh, goes to Minister Forshell. Um, in what way can Swedish industry and innovation contribute to the global energy transition? Well, thank you for that question, and thank you for the possibility to be here today. I think uh, there are numerous possibilities. I believe both Sweden and Australia to be very like-minded countries when it comes to these questions. We have in Sweden for many years been uh, very... Um, been like a, at the forefront of the green transition. I think there also, I know that there is a growing uh, discussion also here in Australia, and we, of course, very much welcome that. Sweden and Australia have been trading with each other for almost 200 years, and I'm very pleased to see that today uh, we have many Swedish companies um, here, in, especially in the green transition, of course. Uh, we have Scania, we have Volvo, we have uh, Ericsson, Epiroc, uh, and many of them are focusing mainly on or they're focusing on the green transition. So I think there are great possibilities here, uh, not only for Swedish companies uh, coming to Australia and investing here, but the, the great thing with, uh, with uh, international trade is that it also goes the other way around. There is also an interest for many Australian companies uh, doing the green transition in Sweden and, and helping us. So there is uh, a great potential here, and we are from the European Union's perspective also uh, putting a lot of focus for having finally that free trade agreement which could also be a cornerstone here when it comes to enabling the green transition. Thank you, Minister. And I think there's some really great suggestions there, perhaps to follow up from people at ANU. Um, so, Martin, uh, so what does Volvo see the trajectory to e-vehicles um, and what role does Volvo play on this, noting that you actually have an example um, just on campus, just outside this building, of uh, where you're going? Absolutely. But like uh, Minister Fischel, delighted to be here. Um, as you can hear, it's not an Aussie accent, it's a Scottish accent. So <laughs> we have a Scozzi with a Swedish company here in, here in Australia. Um, by 2030, Volvo Group, we see that all the trucks, buses, construction equipment, what we sell globally will be about 35% electric. If we take Volvo trucks specifically, by 2030, 50% of what we sell globally will be electric. And of course, we are committed to the Paris Agreement. Our, our targets have been ratified by the SBTI, which means that by 2040, all our solutions will be fossil free. That will be battery electric vehicles, also fuel cell electric vehicles, and the internal combustion engine, particularly in Australia, will run in biofuels, biogas, and maybe even hydrogen internal combustion engine. Of course, as discussed, collaboration, we can't uh, decarbonize the sector on our own, so we believe that partnership is a new leadership, so globally we have some really key partnerships. Uh, we were a founding member of the First Movers Coalition. We have partnerships with our competitors in Europe. We have Traton Group in Daimler. We're, we're working together to accelerate the electric infrastructure for, for recharging. So we anticipate 1,700 plus charging points to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. And here in Australia, we've been building trucks here for 50 years. We celebrated our anniversary last year in Waco. And we intend to build battery electric vehicles here within the next three to four years. Currently, our full Volvo truck range is battery electric vehicle. We have medium duty here. Delighted to say that in December, we announced the, the world's largest order for Volvo medium duty electric vehicles here in Australia. Heavy duty, on the other hand, unfortunately, we can't bring them to Australia right now because of legislation. So I urge academia, government, industry to collaborate, to accelerate legislation change and we can then accelerate the adoption rate of battery electric vehicles. So we are on the journey and we have the products here today and very excited about the future, the transition to a greener future. Um, th thanks, Martin. It's uh, really encouraging to hear the involvement of Volvo. Uh, Australia, as you probably know, is well behind uh, other countries in terms of our EV adoption, um, but we are accelerating that adoption and uh, the ACT is leading that. And so I think uh, at, as of last year, um, I, I think it was 20% of vehicles sold in the ACT were electric vehicles, which was more than twice the av national average. So we're a hotspot for EV adoption here in the ACT. Um, Amani, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your battery grid integration program is doing in terms of vehicle integration into the grid and particularly the 
pilot program you've got with the ACT government. Sure, thanks Mark. Good morning everyone. Um, so in our program we are really focused on developing the technology that we need to support electrification of the grid. And what's important to think about is that we have to be mindful that the relationship between the energy system and people is changing. We're moving to a, a system that's much more decentralised and with people at the centre. So that means the technology looks a bit different to if you didn't have people in the, in the picture. So how do we do that in our program? So we have engineers, we have computer scientists working very closely together with social scientists right here in, um, at the ANU in our engineering school. So I see some students in the audience and encourage you to think about a career in engineering or social science because we need lots of you to help us work on this problem. So the Vehicle to Grid program that you mentioned, Mark, is a really good example of that. Um, the vehicle to Grid is a new technology which allows us to um, use EVs to inject power into the grid um, for the rare times when we need that grid support. So for things like providing frequency support for the grid, providing backup power. I heard of a really nice example the other day in the city of Newcastle where we have um, fire trucks that are electrified that can go out to um, disaster situations like bushfire or flooding and provide that backup power for those communities. So things like that, that's what vehicle to grid is used for. The trial here at the ANU, which is a partnership with ACT government, has 51 um, Nissan LEAF electric vehicles and it's an Australian first and trialling this technology, looking at the kit in the lab, testing it out, also trying to understand what the people side of this technology, what do people want, what do people expect of this technology. So that's really important. We're trying to understand the benefits, the barriers, and so on. So um, it's important work that needs to be done. It um, has challenges. Even in countries that have very high penetration of EV, vehicle to grid rates are still quite low. So we need to address what are the issues, develop the market opportunities, and so on, to make this um, really a viable technology. Thanks, Mark. Thank, thanks, Marty. And I think your, your point that we, we need uh, engineers who also understand social science and vice versa is actually really important. And that's one of the areas where I think we, we do need to um, be considering, you know, how do we actually have a workforce which is appropriately skilled for the jobs of the future. So, so um, Matt, um, Australia has significant challenges ahead in terms of accelerating electrification to meet the ambitious goals of the new government. That's a 43% reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So transport as about 17% of our emissions profile is actually a big contributor to that, our emissions, and um, we need to deal with that. Um, so what do you think we can learn from Sweden in terms of that? Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. And just quickly, uh, apologies from the uh, Minister for Climate Change and Energy, uh, Minister Bowen. He would have loved to have been here today and the Assistant Minister as well. Uh, Parliament sitting at the moment, so there's quite a bit going on. Um, uh, but there is a, a silver lining. You've got me instead, so hopefully <laughs> that's not too bad. I'll use a few stats, so hopefully that won't uh, throw you off. So transport uh, emissions uh, in Australia about 100 uh, million tonnes uh, CO2 equivalent. Uh, our latest projections for 2020, 2035 that we did at the end of last year had it moving up to number one place, so taking over some of the other sectors in terms of the projections. So it's a big part of our economy, transport, and it's something that needs to be um, looked at very closely and it's front of government's mind at the moment. We recently... Um, went consulting about what we needed to do in Australia. When, when you compare us uh, to Sweden, we're well behind in terms of rates of uptake. Um, when we talked to stakeholders uh, in Australia, but overseas as well, we had many people from overseas um, lending uh, information from their experiences, including Sweden, about how we could drive the demand, how we could increase the supply, and how we can get the infrastructure we need, because this is, this is a different world. It's a new way of, of going about transport. 
A couple of the things that pop to my mind is certainly our uptake rate's very low. So it's around 3% of new car sales, uh, electric vehicles. So 3%, when you look at Sweden, they're nearing 50%. So, so quite a way to go. So looking at some of the systems they used over there, the incentives, and you'll see some of the incentives that are coming out from state and territory governments at the moment, at the moment around rebates, stamp duty concessions, um, registration free for a couple of years, I think they have here in Canberra, to drive the uptake. Um, so incentives, Sweden certainly used those, other countries has, and you can see Australia is starting to do that, and that's really important, because there is a, a premium at the moment for battery electric. Uh, vehicles, particularly at that entry level um, where most people we want to encourage to take them up when they're making a choice to buy a new car. So that's really important. Probably the only other thing that's really important to touch on is the infrastructure. Australia is not quite ready. You'll hear there's lots of charging stations being rolled out, but a few numbers again. Um, we've got, uh, I think, around about 5,000 public charging points uh, in Australia at the moment. Lots of plans to roll out a lot more. To give you an idea, I think Sweden's somewhere around 16 to 17,000 uh, charging points. So the infrastructure to keep up with the uptake is just as important. And we can learn from Sweden. They've got some remote and regional areas. They've got some really cold places. We've got some really hot places. Charging infrastructure, uh, obviously, uh, in those areas will not all be the same. So learning from um, others like Sweden and what they've done there would be very valuable for Australia and is valuable for Australia. Thanks, Matt. Um, just moving back to Minister Forshell. Um, so what we've seen over the last year is, is our energy security, both uh, in the EU and globally, is, is not as secure as we thought. And, and so, so we need to, I think, reconfigure um, some of our ideas in relation to this. So, so what do you, what, have you got any insights in terms of the role of international trade and international collaboration uh, to enhance energy security? Thank you very much. And that is actually a question that we are trying to deal with in Europe. And, and as you're aware of, uh, Russia's unprovoked and illegal inv invasion of Ukraine has put focus on these questions. And, and uh, being very honest here, I think uh, at least some, um, some countries in Europe have a very difficult situation right now. And they are facing uh, a dependency on Russia uh, when it comes to imports of gas and, and, uh, and fossil fuels. And that is, um, of course, problematic. Uh, some of uh, the countries in the European Union have ended up facing all these dependencies. And it really underlines the importance of having free trade flows, making sure that you can trade freely with partners and not with countries that you don't want to become dependent of. Uh, Germany is one example. Uh, and there are also other countries in the European Union right now having a very difficult time. And at the same time, you will also have this energy crisis and high inflation and being dependent on Russia. So this is very uh, problematic, and we are trying to deal with this from many different aspects. Of course, we will need to invest even more when it comes to the green transition, um, solar, wind, power. We are also looking at next generation of, of uh, uh, nuclear. At the same time, um, having more, uh, more open trade is, is of great importance to us. I believe the whole in the Pacific region here uh, is uh, high on our agenda, not only in Sweden's agenda, but the whole of the European Union. And I think that also goes the other way around. I mean, I hope that having this free trade agreement between Australia and the European Union would also enable Australia to, uh, to trade more freely with uh, a huge market. I mean, 27 different countries in the whole of Europe is a huge possibility for many Australian countries and also providing Australia with a possibility of not becoming dependent on countries that don't share the same fundamental values when it comes to democracy and freedom of speech, etc. So I believe, uh, to summarize, uh, in today's world, trade is not only about figures and economic growth and job, it is also, also about security. And that is what we are facing in Europe right now, and this is also our focus for, for the future, try to merge these two things into one and find synergies. Thanks very much for that. And, and, I, and I think it does highlight um, that um, when you look at Europe, it's not just what's going on with Ukraine, but the super hot summer actually resulted, for example, in France shutting down half of its nuclear power fleet. And, 
Uh, and so, so you can get multiplying things coming out of uh, these interactions between these big drivers. Um, just moving back to Martin. Um, so just thinking about um, the sort of Australian context and the needs of the Australian consumers and the Australian environment and taking into account what Matt said, big differences between Sweden and Australia, say in temperature, um, what might be some of the particular considerations you take into account in how you roll out your vehicle fleet um, sales here? I would, I would say that first and foremost, we need sustainability leaders. We spoke about partnership and collaboration. And I have to say that ACT, ESA are real sustainability leaders uh, when it comes to state government. And uh, we have a partnership there that you may be aware of. Um, so that's important that sustainability leaders come together. Legislation needs to change. You know, we have medium duty uh, battery electric vehicles here today. I'm also a member of the Truck Industry Council of Australia, so all the other OEMs feel the same way. So um, if we get legislation changed, we can accelerate the uptake of heavy duty battery electric vehicles. So if we take Melbourne up to, to uh, Brisbane, uh, roughly 80% of the, the freight task is performed in those routes. So we can see that's a key area for us to accelerate the transition. Then of course we spoke about uh, you know, the infrastructure um, we spoke about what we see in Europe, what we see in Sweden and the rest of Europe. We really need to collaborate here in Australia to, to accelerate that. M business industry is not waiting. You know, we have the demand is very high for heavy duty uh, trucks and customers have their own solutions where they can actually charge the vehicles at base, then they work for the day, come back again. But of course, where we have interstate and longer distances, that becomes a challenge. So really, the, the technology is there, we need academia, government, industry to collaborate, to accelerate the transition, get legislation change, and it will happen. Thank, thanks very much, Martin. And, and I think that uh, is, is a really important point. How do you actually accelerate the transition? And it's about people as well as about the technology and policy. Uh, and that, I think, brings us to the last question here, which is to Marnie, which is, you know, how do you best incorporate social and psychological considerations into the enhancing the energy transition? <coughs> yeah, thanks, Mike. So, as I mentioned, I think it's crucial that technologists work together with social scientists. And most importantly, we need to go out and ask people what they want. What, what do you want from the energy transition? What do you want when you have a, an electric vehicle? Do you want to use it to support the grid? How do you want to use your household battery? Would you rather have a neighbourhood battery instead of a household battery? I think people are at the centre of the energy transition in Australia and we need to understand what, what you want. Thank, thanks, Marnie, for that. Um, so that just uh, opens it up uh, the opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, some microphones, or a microphone, I think, over there. Um, so if anyone wants to ask questions of the panel, feel free. So I think you have to go up to the mic. Is that the thing? So you've got to move to the mic, not the other way around. Um, introduce yourself first too. Yes, yeah, sorry, Adam Shirley. I work at ABC Canberra here locally. Um, I originally did environmental science way back when I was a student, so I've always had an interest in these sorts of matters. Um, thank you all for the presentation and, and welcome to our visitors. It's great to have you in our little old town. Um, I think for all of you, um, particularly to you, Minister Fossil, but I'm interested in the whole panel's views. In Australia, I think we know that a want for a transition and an acceleration of it is in part dependent on what the fossil fuel companies do or don't want to do. This country, as we know, has in recent times been founded on big profits from fossil fuel miners and companies, and that's a fact, like it or don't. I'm interested, Minister, from your perspective, on what degree of strong arming is required to take the whip hand, as some see it, out of the fossil fuel companies ride if you will and to and there's been a bit about legislation to change leg legislation to fundamentally change the incentives for 100 percent electrification because that politically as well as practically has been i think an issue that has fallen governments in recent times here so I, i'd love to know your views on that and whether that realistically will happen anytime soon thank you that's a difficult question uh, <laughs> 
I will make my best not to comment on domestic uh, politics here in Australia, but I can, I, I can give you the Swedish perspective because I think what has happened in Sweden over the last couple of years, talking about the green transition, is that there has been a fundamental change in the discussion. Uh, if I had been here 10 or 15 years ago, I would say the green transition was back then something that we needed to do. It was a must. We didn't really want to, but we had to because of all the climate uh, change, etc. Looking at Sweden today, when I talk to the largest Swedish enterprises and private investors, they will tell me that, you know, the green transition today, there are numerous opportunities here. It's something that we don't only have to do, it's something that we want to do, because we can make money of it. There are so many possibilities for uh, economic growth, uh, foreign trade, investments, creating uh, economic growth, creating jobs, basically. And I, I believe that is... A that is uh, just to underline the, the dramatic shift that has taken place here. And I can give you one example. Ten years ago, in the northern parts of Sweden, it's freezing cold all the time. It's, but not in summer. Then you will have like um, billions of mosquitoes. I, I love this part of the, <laughs> of the country, I must say, even if it doesn't uh, sound like that. But uh, looking at facts, ten years ago, people would be leaving the northern parts of Sweden uh, because there were no jobs. Today, there is an industrial revolution going on in the northern parts of Sweden, and it has to do with batteries. Uh, there are uh, numerous uh, different companies located there producing world-class batteries, which are needed for, I mean, the, the, the uh, transportation sector, etc. Today's problem in the northern parts of Sweden is another one. How can we attract all the amount of people that we need to come here and work? <laughs> So 10 years ago, people were leaving, and now we are trying to, okay, how, uh, we, were gonna, we need to build more houses. We need to invest in new schools, new hospitals. We need to attract people from all over the world. Just to give you an example and an understanding of the revolution that is taking place here and how the green transition in Sweden has moved from becoming something that we had to do into, some, into the being, you know, uh, really... Uh, so many, uh, an area where we have so many opportunities for not only doing good, but also in doing a great business out of it. I hope you understand what I mean. And I think that is the, the right perspective also for many other countries, just like Australia. We need to see the, all the, the uh, great possibilities that lies ahead of us here. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Um, Matt, did you want to? Yeah, um, um, certainly won't take the political element that, but I probably could talk about the current government's approach and some of the things that they're, they're looking to do. I think probably most importantly, and just picking up on the ministers uh, uh, talking about regional and remote areas, the, the government's uh, um, announced a $1.9 billion Powering the Regions Fund, which is to assist some of these regional areas that, you know, have um, an investment uh, in the technology that has been very, uh, very good for Australia in terms of the economy. So transition and take up the opportunities that might exist with new, new clean energy and, and new industries, but also to be able to decarbonise as well. So there's a recognition of there, there needs to be some um, money to help with that. The second thing I think, uh, and that it's happening and sort of very topical at the moment, is the, the safeguard mechanism in Australia, uh, which is uh, captures you know, over just over 200 of the largest emitters uh, in Australia and, and working uh, with them to reduce their emissions over time to sort of help with the transition to be able to make sure that our targets for 2035 and 2050 are available. So that's currently being consulted on. Um, that's part of the solution. It's making sure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to feed into that process, but also to sort of... It sends a signal that serious, the government's serious about that. There's nothing needs to be done. And probably the last thing which I think is important is when you look at a lot of them countries, uh, sorry, companies, um, a lot of them have net zero 2050 targets already, nearly all of them. Uh, so they're already doing a lot of work in that space to be able to um, uh, develop products or uh, change processes or do things in their business that are much better for the climate. Thanks, Matt. I'll put a comment, Mark. Um, on this note, from, from an industry perspective in business, um, sustainable business must be profitable, and profitable business must be sustainable. I've met with some fuel companies who are really keen to collaborate for electric vehicle charging. I would say that the biggest barrier right now is legislation. 
there's a, there's a strong demand from business. There, there's a real desire to be more sustainable and towards fossil free. Of course, some, some companies get, have got a bigger challenge than others, but there's a real desire there to, to, to accelerate the journey. Thanks very much, Matt, for that. Uh, I'm sorry, Martin. Um, so next question, if we can keep both the questions and the responses down, because we've got quite a queue of people. Um, but uh, next question. Um, thank you all for your presentation. Uh, my name's Neil Bibby. I'm the editor of the Asia Pacific Fire and Disaster magazine and an ex-fire chief. Martin, in your presentation, I counted four times you said there's legislation changes required. What are these barriers to entry that are stopping heavy vehicles coming into Australia? That's a very good question that I've asked many times. Um, coming from, from Europe where we have uh, 27 countries can, can work in legislation and uh, execute on that uh, quite efficiently. Um, of course, Australia has the federal, state and local governments that uh, everyone has a view on um, axle weights and vehicle widths is a, is, is a key issue here. So um, if we get those axle uh, weights increased on the front axle, along the same lines as what Europe has today, not any greater, and the, the width which Europe has today, then we can, we can accelerate the, the, the transition very quickly. Um, and, and that's the fundamental barrier at the moment, you're seeing? It is the barrier. Okay, yep. <laughs> Okay, um, it, it's a call for standardisation, it sounds like, which uh, makes a lot of sense from the point of view of... And, and maybe just to, to follow up, during our consultation, that, that came through loud and clear, some of the, some of the settings uh, for Australia, which our, um, a lot of people tell you this, they're there for good reason, we need to work through them to be able to sort of adjust them, uh, axles and widths of, widths of cards, which notwithstanding um, those changes, we've also uh, heard from uh, people interested in this is infrastructure again. So certainly the vehicles are getting in here, but rolling out the infrastructure. A lot of um, investment through ARENA in trialling some of these technologies, back to base technologies, whether it's battery in Sydney or they've done hydrogen down in Melbourne. Um, there's still some more work to be done to be able to enable when those vehicles do come in the infrastructure. Uh, thanks, Matt. We've got about 10 minutes more for questions. So next question. <coughs> Hi, I'm Janelino from Diplomats for Climate Action now. Um, I have a question for Matt and probably Martin on... Um, Matt, when you talked about electric vehicle take-up, you were talking about ways of driving demand. It seems to me that there is a plenty of demand out there in the Australian community. Uh, the problem is supply. So I'm asking you and probably the head of Volvo to tell us uh, I mean, you've partly answered the question on heavy vehicles, but on sort of light, personal, normal people vehicles, what do you need to increase supply into the Australian market? I'm happy to start with that one. So, uh, again, consultation, um, pretty much unanimously, um, uh, all stakeholders said some form of a fuel efficiency standard for Australia was the best way to tackle supply. Um, so that's something we've heard through consultation. Um, that's something that doesn't exist in Australia at the moment. So that is something that we've heard loud and clear. Beyond that, um, we are seeing more and more uh, vehicles coming on uh, into Australia. Australia's, um, how would you describe, I suppose every country's a little bit different, the terrain, uh, sometimes we're the same, sometimes we're different. But we love four-wheel drives, uh, we love utes, uh, we love those types of cars. They're coming, EVs. Uh, the first utes are being sold. There's, there's Australia startups that are converting existing utilities um, into electric vehicles. We have heavy, uh, rigid um, truck development battery uh, down in Melbourne, I can think of. So we're starting to adopt uh, um, the, the supply um, in those areas, but certainly um, loud and clear through our consultation with everyone was the single biggest driver, particularly in that light vehicle, would be a fuel efficiency standard. And some of the things they quote to us when we talked to them was about, um, in the first world, there's just Russia and ourselves who don't have a fuel efficiency standard. Even New Zealand does, so, geez. <laughs> and you know how like, we like to beat New Zealand. <laughs> Only fairly, though, no underarms. 
I think we've discussed heavy duty truck as, as a, a driver of a Volvo uh, electric vehicle. Um, it's a, a hybrid vehicle and of course uh, the charging infrastructure is the main, main issue there. So uh, I drive more often in, in, in the petrol engine than, than I would like to. So I can only charge at home and then charge at the office. So more charging stations in Australia would certainly accelerate private car electric vehicles. Thanks, Martin. Uh, next question. Uh, Francis Clark, farmer from New South Wales. I'm about to take delivery of a Nissan Leaf in the next two or three weeks, but I find, first of all, the Australian standard does not allow uh, vehicle to uh, grid at this stage, although South Australia appears to have found a, a way around it. So I'd like to know when the Australian standard is likely to change and also a question to New South Wales, which I've already forwarded to Matt Keane, the Minister, as to when he is going to permit vehicle to grid being allowed in New South Wales. You could probably talk to that. Uh, uh, the, the Commonwealth in partnership with states and territories is actually uh, working on a pathway for the harmonisation of connections of vehicle to grid. They're due to report back to energy ministers in the middle of the year on the plans for doing that. Thanks, Matt. I guess it does raise a question, Martin. Um, is vehicle to grid on Volvo's radar? Absolutely. Any technology that can, can support the adoption rate is certainly on the radar, but uh, Martin knows more about that than I do. Thank you. Sounds like it should be. Okay, next question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ankith. I'm in year 12 from Narabunda College. So my question is that electrification and the development towards EV has been estimated to cost about 500,000 jobs in the EU alone and replace about 225 jobs. So incurring in a net loss of about 275,000 jobs. And this is according to the industry trade group Klepper. So my question is to you, do you think that the education system and, the, and a focus on upskilling is required and this has to be designed and catered towards the future of the world needs? I'll try. <laughs> um, of course, when we moved from the horse and carriage to, to the motor vehicle, there was a huge de 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 disruption and created new jobs while killing off many industries. We can see much the same here. Actually, Volvo in Sweden, we have their engine factory in Hovda. Mm -hmm. And we, we've just announced a, a, a new battery plant there because as internal combustion engines maybe drop down the battery electric vehicles come up. How do we create jobs? And we can see that, and Minister Purcell mentioned, the opportunity in Australia for battery uh, production. Um, Volvo announced the very first heavy vehicle, heavy truck made of fossil free steel, a partnership with SSAB in Sweden. We have lots of green hydrogen, lots of iron ore in Australia. So I think there's many opportunities in Australia to create new industry and manufacturing, perhaps less exporting. And I think you should come to study engineering at the ANU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if I can just add to that, I think, I mean, I gave a very positive perspective and I truly believe that there are great opportunities from the whole green transition. Um, but of course, there are also challenges and you pointed one uh, we need to adopt when it comes to, um, to the educational system, for example. Uh, we are trying to do that. It's not easy. You can't really command people to take that education instead of that one, uh, so it need to be based on what people really want to do. But at least our perspective from Sweden is that when you when you try to explain the possibilities that lie ahead of you, and I, I mentioned before the northern parts of Sweden and the whole green industrial revolution that is taking place now, there uh, people they react to that and and they they uh, they also believe and the, when they see the opportunities that come for themselves. Another challenge I want to mention here is that. Talking about the electrification of the transportation system, uh, it also requires much more electricity. And it's not only about transportation, it's also about the green steel, for example. In, in Sweden now, uh, according to the last surveys here, we are talking about um, a 100 percent increase uh, in the need for electricity over the, over the coming 20 years. So that is a great uh, challenge to us. What, what we're trying to do now, or the situation that we're facing, is that we need to double the production of electricity without relying on fossil fuels. Because at the same time, we have another goal of having no fossil fuels at all, 2040. So, uh, of course, that is, 
That's, that's a great, uh, very important question. And we are, as I said, we are trying to focus now more on solar, wind, but also hydro. And in combination with that, also the next generation of nuclear um, for having like a, a base uh, in, in the energy system. And Sweden and Australia also share another um, um, challenge there. We're also very uh, large countries when it comes to size. So we need to build a grid that, that works for everyone in the whole of, of, of our respective countries. Probably the only thing I'd add to that is that, it, that skills definitely uh, on the mind of, of the government. Um, they've announced in the last budget, I think, new energy skills funding and new energy apprenticeships funding. Um, and certainly the Powering the Regions Fund, I talked about the 1.9 billion, it recognises workforce and workforce development as an important part of that transition. And beyond that, um, I've been down to the manufacturer of some of these battery vehicles down in Melbourne and they showed me the engine and they say, if you're a diesel mechanic, you'd be all dirty and you'd be covered you know, in heaps of oil and all that. He said, there's less moving parts, you plug in the computer and it's much easier and you can do 10 a day instead of one. Why wouldn't you like a job like that? It's much easier. And uh, certainly that would, my children would relate to that because when they can sit in the computer and plug it in and not necessarily have to get their hands dirty, that's the new world. Thanks for bringing it down to earth, Matt. Um, <laughs> so just one last quick question. Uh, uh, I'm Beck. I'm a year 11 student from Narrabunda College. And so whilst we continuously hear that companies are aiming towards net zero by 2050, we never really hear about how they plan to reach that goal. And so I guess for us, how can we hold these companies accountable for that goal whilst not knowing how they plan to get there? Thanks, Vic. Who's picking that one up? <laughs> I seem to be speaking quite often here. Um, it's a very good point, actually, that, um, you know, uh, when I was studying, you know, the bottom line was that the measure. Um, we predicted that will be triple bottom lines in the future. So we now see that companies are, not, are measured not just in profitability, but of course, their environmental credentials and sustainability. Um, all I, can, I can only speak on behalf of Volvo. We've set a clear plan, as I've said. Our targets have been ratified by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Um, we're investing more than ever before in, in, to achieve those targets. So it's, it's uh, for all to see, and it's publicly um, uh, you know, announced. Um, in Australia, for example, uh, that is part of this, uh, all our facilities, our factory and all our facilities, uh, consume 100% green energy. So, as well as the, the 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 vehicles that we produce in use, of course, uh, CO2 is produced. But the whole production system and the supply chain, we we work and we have get clear targets for that. So, I feel many more companies maybe make the commitment, but uh, I agree with you. Perhaps we need to um, publicly uh, produce uh, the the targets and how we're meeting those targets. Yes, I'll try to be brief, if, even though it's difficult for a politician, but uh, <laughs> I'll do my best there. And I'll just say that I think it's important here to build partnerships with companies, because the truth is that the green transition is impossible without cooperating with them. Uh, the need for us is to make sure that we have a legislation that has a long-term focus, that is stable, that gives the right conditions, and that is also very ambitious. Uh, I, I think um, from a Euro European perspective, we also have the, the, the challenge of making sure that we have like, the same kind of legislation in all countries. So you will not have an, uh, end up with a situation where one company can't uh, compete with another company in another, in another uh, country that is located very nearby. So legislation must really lead the way here, but at the same time, make sure to build partners, uh, partnerships with private companies. And for my my opinion is that at least most of them, I would say, they are interested in, in this and, and want to do good because they understand that if they do this right, they can make money out of it. Thanks, and Mani, quickly. Um, thank you very much for the question. It's a really important question to ask. Trust and accountability are real issues at the moment. In Australia, we have really low levels of trust in the energy industry. In fact, only one in five Australians believe the energy industry is acting in their interests. So it's an issue, it's something that we have to focus on in the future. 
Thank, thanks, Marnie. It's a really important point there. And, and I was going to just respond as well. Um, the, the issues that you've raised uh, in terms of accountability um, are, are crucial, um, particularly for the younger generation. And so thank you for that question. Uh, so um, Australia's regulators uh, are now right onto this, you know, addressing greenwashing. Uh, we see the issues about integrity in our carbon credits uh, system being raised, including by uh, people from ANU, and Professor Andrew McIntosh. Uh, significant issues there yet to be resolved, in my view. Uh, we see this uh, propagating right through business uh, and, and now starting to have adoption of the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure and also the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure and the bringing in of a sustainability accounting standards, uh, which I think will tighten up uh, those issues that you raise and, and give less leeway for manipulating the system and greenwashing. So I think these are some of the things which will be particularly important over the next uh, decades as we actually start to really bite into this transition that we're seeing, because this is a huge transition. This is one of the biggest transitions humanity will go through. So um, just to uh, wrap up, um, we've, we've had, a, I think, a really great uh, event here. We've heard some uh, really constructive comments from the Crown Princess. Uh, we've heard uh, the, the role that ANU can play uh, in terms of this international uh, transition that we're going through from the Vice-Chancellor. We've heard some really interesting perspectives from both governments, uh, from industry and from researchers uh, here today, um, uh, fleshing out um, some of the detail of what this might mean for individuals, for countries, and for the globe. And so I wonder, everyone, if I can thank the panel. <laughs> and, and in particular, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel uh, for attending here today and gracing us with your presence. So if everyone can stay seated whilst the Royal uh, Party uh, departs, um, and then we'll have the, the next row um, departing along with everyone else. So thanks again. <laughs>